Chapter Twenty Six of the Three Midshipmen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Three Midshipmen by William Henry Giles Kingston. Chapter Twenty Six. Another fierce conflict. A ship on shore is at all times a melancholy spectacle but very sad it makes the hearts of those feel who see their own vessel lying among rocks in strange seas far away from any friendly ports and surrounded by enemies mr cherry and his companions pulled away with all their might to ascertain the worst the frigate during this time occasionally fired one of her bow guns as they drew nearer they perceived that she was doing so at a fleet of war junks clustering in the distance but who prudently were keeping out of range of her shot still from their remaining where they were it was evident that they were meditating an attack on her should another gale spring up or any other currents give them a chance of success the boats could not be of any great assistance but still they would be of some use in the exertions to be made in getting her off the brig would be of far more service but where she was it was difficult to say when last seen she was in a chase of another fleet of pirates to the northward when they got alongside every man of the frigate's crew was busily engaged in efforts to get the ship off mr cherry and his party were warmly welcomed however and in spite of the fatigue they had gone through they all at once lent a hand to effect the desired object anchors were got out astern the anchors and some of the heavy guns were lowered into the boats and the capstan was manned round went the men with the capstan bars but the cables were soon stretched to their utmost and there they stood pressing with might and main but not an inch did the frigate move we shall have to start the water and heave some of the stores and guns overboard i fear observed the first lieutenant to the captain we will do anything rather than lose our guns said captain grant i have no fancy to have our teeth drawn the crew may rest for a spell see there is a breeze coming ahead observed the captain after some time man the capstan again set the mainsail mizzen topsail and gallant sail let the people run from side to side as the capstan goes round the orders were put into execution the men strained every nerve as before suddenly the capstan went round an inch then another and another was it the anchors coming home no the ship herself was moving everybody on board felt her move hurrah hurrah it was a general shout again the men sprang round with the capstan bars the frigate was afloat she was soon hauled off into deep water the well was sounded but she did not appear to have received any damage night was now coming on and the master was unwilling to take the ship through the intricate channels among which she was entangled without daylight to guide him she was therefore brought up with a spring on her cables ready to make sail should any emergency arise to make this necessary the three old messmates were now together again for the first time since they left england jack and adair had all their adventures to tell to murray who was keeping the first watch and so though tired as they were they preferred walking the deck with him to turning in and going to sleep the night was very dark but the wind fell and it became almost calm so that the only sound was the splash of the water as the swell broke over the reef ahead all on board had reason to be thankful that they were not on it the young men had a good deal to talk about but it did not prevent them keeping their eyes about them or their ears open jack also did not forget his young charge little harry bevan it is high time we should be thinking of turning in he observed 
but i must see first how harry gets on he went below to the berth where the young midshipman had been placed and found one of the assistant surgeons with him the poor boy was very feverish and was continually crying out for lemonade and other cooling beverages jack sat with him for some time till he became calmer and better and then went on deck to have another look out before he turned in for the night as not belonging to the ship he had no watch to keep he found the officer of the watch murray and others peering through the darkness over the frigate's quarter some suspicious sounds were heard coming from that direction remarked murray there were voices a creaking of blocks and the splash of oars it is just to windward and sounds travel a long distance in a dark night our friends the pirates are about some mischief perhaps they expect to find us napping and purpose paying a visit everybody on deck was on the alert and there was not much chance of the crew of the frigate being taken by surprise at all events captain grant was told of what had occurred they waited and waited but still nothing more was seen or rather heard of the pirate junks yet murray and mr cherry and all the officers who had been on deck were so certain that they had not been deceived that it was concluded that the pirates had been really close to them but finding the frigate afloat had thought better of the matter and hauled off jack and adair at last went below jack did not turn in but lay down on one of the lockers in the midshipman's berth with a writing desk for a pillow and a boat cloak for a mattress the instant he put his head on the desk he was fast asleep it appeared to him but a moment afterwards that he heard the cry all hands on deck immediately afterwards several shots were fired from the frigate he was up in a moment on looking out he saw the dark shadowy forms of numerous large war junks gliding round the ship and the next instant a shower of jingle balls and round shot came rattling on deck the salute was returned by a broadside from the frigate which if it did not send several of the pirates junks to the bottom must have severely crippled a number of them they must have thought that the frigate was still ashore or that she had hove her guns overboard to get off or they would not have ventured so near still the unseen enemy showed more courage than might have been expected and from every direction on every beam and ahead and astern a shower of missiles came crashing in which could not fail to do a considerable amount of damage the cries of several poor fellows showed that they were badly wounded while one seaman standing close to jack rogers fell heavily to the deck jack stooped to raise him but the man did not speak and from the inert weight of the body he feared too truly that he was killed the worst part of the business was that from the excessive darkness of the night and the thick mist which hung over the water it was only from the flashes of the enemy's guns that the frigate's crew were able to see how to point theirs by the cries and shrieks which arose every now and then in the distance they had reason to believe that their shot had told with dire effect still the pirate's shot was doing them a great deal of mischief and notwithstanding all their courage and power all they could do in return was blindly to blaze away still there could be no doubt that the pirates would ultimately get the worst of it and haul off long before morning of course in daylight they would not venture to remain near her after the frigate had fired several broadsides it was discovered that the enemy on each side did not reply but that all the shot came from ahead or astern again the guns being loaded captain grant hauled in on the spring so as to bring the broadsides in the direction the head and stern had before been the word fire was given 
instantly the terrific shrieks which rent the air showed that the enemy had there been most thickly assembled some random shots were fire in return and then all was silent really it is difficult to imagine that so short a time ago the ship was surrounded by bloodthirsty enemies observed murray to jack as they stood together looking out into the darkness besides the poor fellows who have been hit i dare say that our running rigging and sails will show that we have been engaged yet now how calm and quiet everything is i for one would not trust them though said jack if they can play us a trick they will that night however wore on the pirates had evidently a sufficient taste of the frigate's quality and had no wish to try it further once more jack was going below to finish his nap on the locker when he heard adair sing out there are two big junks close aboard us captain grant was on deck in an instant and ordered the capstan to be manned to work the ship round as might be required they are desperate fellows on board those crafts or they would not attempt to get so near us observed adair they are indeed said jack see there's another of them i don't like their looks i wonder the captain has not ordered us to fire at them just then captain grant's voice was heard ordering the boats to be lowered scarcely were the words out of his mouth than a bright light burst out of one of the junks and instantly she was in flames casting forth rockets and missiles in every direction they are fire ships cried numerous voices a very evident fact without a moment's delay jack and murray and adair with two of the lieutenants of the frigate and the men nearest at hand jumped into the boats and being lowered pulled off to tow the fireboats away from her as in consequence of the darkness they had been brought thus close up before they were discovered there was little time to spare one in another minute would be alongside jack boldly sprang up her high bow and making fast a tow rope ordered the men to give way the spring on the frigate's cable was manned and her broadside was turned away from the approaching fireboats scarcely had jack got hold of his prize than the flames burst forth from her and he and the crew were covered with sparks and burning fragments of wood which several times nearly set their clothes on fire and singed them not a little fortunately the rockets and other fireworks on board took an upward flight but they soon found themselves pulling under a complete cascade of fire jack cheered them on never mind my lads he shouted it's better than having the old frigate burnt at all events he could scarcely bear the heat of the fire still he persevered at last he got his unpleasant captive just clear astern of the frigate and a little way to leeward. still a shift of wind might send her back so he was towing her a little farther when with a loud roar some magazine which had been hitherto preserved at the bottom of the ship exploded sending every particle of her which remained high into the air and as the wreck came down the fragments very nearly swamped the boat and killed all in her no one was hurt however and he and his brave crew instantly pulled back to grapple with another foe all the other fire-ships had been seized hold of and were very nearly towed clear of the frigate jack heard murray's voice calling to him alec was fast to one which seemed heavier than the rest and he had great difficulty apparently in moving her had not jack gone to his assistance in a few seconds she would have been alongside the frigate when just under her stern she broke out into the fiercest flames and jack whose clothes were by this time very nearly done brown was glad enough to cast loose from her in another moment she blew up with a violent explosion and as before 
fragments of the burning wreck came flaming down into and around the boats while the other fire ships were still burning away brightly to leeward once more the boats were hoisted up and the frigate was made ready to get under way the instant daylight would allow her to be carried free of the reefs just as one of the quarter boats was being secured a splash was heard and instantly a cry was raised a man overboard jack rogers who was on the quarter-deck without stopping to ask who it was kicked off his shoes and threw off his jacket and gliding down a rope struck out astern there was a strong current running he had before discovered and he knew that the man who had fallen overboard would be carried rapidly away from the ship who are you he sang out in a loud voice tell me that i may know where to swim to you there was no answer it was mr murray sir cried someone from the ship we are afraid that he must have hurt himself as he fell this was sad news to jack still he determined to persevere the only light he had to guide him was from the burning fire ships now drifting away should murray come to the surface he hoped he might see him and be near enough to support him till a boat could arrive and pick them up he heard the sounds of a boat being lowered from the frigate he raised himself out of the water for an instant to look around and he felt sure that he perceived a person's head not far off he made strenuous efforts to reach it just then also he saw the glare of the burning vessel being cast on it what he would rather not have seen a large chinese boat he was certain that the head was murray's his old friend was drifting rapidly down towards the pirates he had every reason to fear that they would strike at alec the moment he got near he knew also that they would equally strike at him but this did not make him hesitate a moment he clove the water with all his might dashing on till he was close up to the drowning man he hoped that the pirates might not have seen him a few more strokes and i shall have him he exclaimed to himself just then he saw some of the savage-looking pirates standing up in the boat peering towards him a gleam of light fell on the head of the person in the water it was murray he seized his friend by the collar and turned him on his back then struck out once more towards the frigate of course he had but one hand at liberty and in spite of all his efforts he could not stem the current but found himself and murray still drifting down towards their relentless foes some accident had apparently happened to the boat and he could not tell whether or not she was even yet in the water he could do nothing but keep himself and his companion afloat he dared not shout as his so doing would draw the attention of the pirates towards them and he felt sure that at all events a boat would be sent to look for him jack and alec had now another danger to encounter they were drifting down on one of the fire ships and ran a great chance of being burnt to avoid the fire ship jack was obliged to approach nearer the pirate boat which had been keeping so as to leave the burning vessel between her and the frigate the miscreants now saw him and dashing their paddles in the water were rapidly up to him he fully expected that the next moment would be his last but he still held fast the senseless form of his friend he looked up for an instant and saw the hideous countenances of the chinamen glaring down on him over the side of their boat End of chapter 26 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 27 of The Three Midshipmen 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Three Midshipmen by William Henry Giles Kingston. Chapter 27 chasing the pirate fleet adair had just come on deck when jack jumped overboard to save murray and he was on the point of jumping in after him when his arm was seized and he found himself held back by captain grant you would uselessly risk your life adair exclaimed the captain lower that gig be sharp about it you may go in her several men with adair had instantly flown to the boat nearest them and under the direction of the captain were lowering her when the afterfall gave way and up she swung by the bows most of her gear falling into the water as did one or two of the men in her he was a good swimmer and struck out boldly to keep up alongside the ship but the current was too strong for him and before a rope could be heaved to him he gradually dropped astern the fall had been injured by one of the enemy's shots another boat was now lowered but in consequence of the darkness and the disarrangement incidental to the work in which the men had been engaged more delay than usual occurred at last the boat was lowered and manned and adair and mr cherry jumping into her away they pulled to pick up in the first place the poor fellow who had just fallen into the water they shouted out his name a faint cry reached their ears he had already got a long way from the ship it took some time before they could find him he must have sunk once and they caught him just as he came up again he was insensible when they hauled him into the boat adair wanted to go on but mr cherry said that he feared the man would die if they did and that it was his duty to carry him on board i fear too that there is little chance of our picking up the other two poor fellows he observed they must have drifted a long way by this time and can scarcely have kept afloat you don't know sir what a superb swimmer jack rogers is exclaimed adair he will keep up for an hour or more i have no fear on that score let us get this man on board and we'll soon find him terence had never in his life felt so deeply anxious as he now did the boat rapidly returned to the ship the nearly drowned man was hoisted on deck and then once more they shoved off and fast as the men could bend their oars they pulled in the direction it was supposed murray and jack must have drifted the fire-ships were still blazing away as the boat approached them i think that they cannot be far from here said mr cherry steady now lads paddle gently keep a lookout on either side all of you terence however thought that they might have drifted farther on rogers ahoy he stood up and shouted jack roberts where are you just then one of the fire ships would, which had been burning most furiously and concealed everything on the other side of her blew up with a loud explosion scattering her burning fragments far and wide around her several pieces of blazing timber fell into the boat among the men one or two were much hurt and they had enough to do to heave the bits overboard to prevent the boat herself catching fire terence was in an agony of fear for the sake of his friends a single fragment of the burning ship falling on them would have sent them to the bottom still he would not give up all hope but continued searching mr cherry now agreed that if they were still on the surface they must have drifted further on so on they pulled slowly looking out as before they had gone a little way when a man in the bows said he saw a boat in the distance mr cherry made her out also perhaps they may have reached her he observed 
this was very little consolation to terence because he did not think it probable if as there was little doubt she was a pirate's boat her crew would let them live still he was eager to go in chase mr cherry who was more calm thought it would be wiser to look about on every side to ascertain if jack was still floating near again and again they called to him but there was no answer either they have been picked up or are drowned said the lieutenant terence's heart sank within him mr cherry now agreed to go in chase of the chinaman's boat away they dashed their shouts of course had given notice of their approach and the boat was evidently pulling on rapidly before them bright sparkles of light fell from the blades of their oars and in their wake appeared a long fiery line as the boat glided over the dark smooth water two of the fire-ships were still burning and their position with the distant signal lights of the frigate enabled them to keep in the direction they believed the two midshipmen had drifted the chinaman's boat pulled fast and they appeared to be very slightly gaining on her adair believed that the only chance of saving his old companions lives was to overtake her mr cherry already gave them up as lost still he was determined if possible to overhaul the boat the crew bent manfully to their oars it did not occur to any one for some time that they had left the ship unarmed except that two of the men had pistols in their belts and one had still his cutlass while mr cherry had jumped into the boat without unbuckling his sword never mind the boat stretchers must serve those who haven't better weapons very likely the chinamen in the boats are no better off exclaimed terence in his eagerness the lieutenant agreeing with him on they went we shall have her at last cried adair we are gaining on her i am certain of it but hello what are those lights there ahead of us he added after some time the question was soon answered for looming through the darkness appeared a long line of large war junks behind which the boats of which they were in pursuit rapidly glided they must have been seen from the junks for directly afterwards they were saluted by a thick shower of jingle bullets while several rounds shot came whizzing past them terence in the impulse of the moment was for dashing on and attacking the nearest junks but as mr cherry had discretion as well as valour he ordered the men to pull round their starboard oars and to get out of the range of the shot as fast as they could it was rather too much for even six british seamen and two officers to do to attack a whole fleet of war junks terence was of the same opinion with heavy hearts they pulled back against the current to the frigate fully believing that rogers and murray were lost to them forever as soon as they made their report captain grant expressed his wish to make an attempt at all events to ascertain the fate of the two midshipmen if the frigate was got under way with the strong current which was then making she would most certainly be drifted on to the reefs a boat expedition was the only means left for doing anything immediately all boats of the ship were manned with guns in their bows and and this time the crews went well armed away they pulled resolving if they did not find the two young officers to make the pirates pay dearly for their loss the rest of the fire ships had burned out so it was now quite dark the men were in their usual spirits when fighting was to be done and were highly pleased at the thoughts of getting alongside the villains with whom they had hitherto been playing at long bowls a game to which jack had a great dislike terence had needham in his boat they had pulled for a considerable distance and adair thought that they ought to be up with the enemy can you manage to make out the junk stick he sang out no sir i can see nothing ahead whatever was the unsatisfactory answer 
so they pulled on yet farther still no junks were to be seen on proceeded the flotilla till they had considerably passed the spot where mr cherry and adair had fallen in with the enemy mr cherry considered that it was not prudent to separate so kept the boats together after again pulling some way to the east they first took a northerly course and then swept round again towards the south but not a trace of a boat or vessel of any sort could they discover just before dawn very considerably disappointed the expedition returned to the frigate as the sun rose a breeze sprang up and once more the anchor was weighed the sails were let fall and the frigate stood out of her perilous position a steady hand in each of the main chains kept the lead going while the master with anxious countenance stood on the bowsprit issuing his orders as to how the ship was to be steered starboard he cried starboard was the answer with a long cadence port port it is sounded from aft steady the seeming echo answered now the ship was tacked now she cut into the wind's eye now she was kept away now coral rocks rose up close to her now the channel was so narrow that it seemed as if there was not room for her to pass through it everybody breathed more freely when she was at last in clear water again what had become of the junks it was impossible to say not a sail was to be seen from the masthead altogether the affair in which they had been engaged had been disastrous and an unusual gloom was cast over the ship's company the frigate stood round the group of islands a complete archipelago with numerous intricate passages between them sometimes she brought up and the boats were sent away and strict search was made for the piratical fleet indeed no trouble or exertion was spared but all was without result no tidings could be gained either of the brig or of the fleet of piratical junks at length the frigate entered the chinese waters and anchored off canton one chinese city is very much like another they are surrounded by castellated walls some thirty feet in height and coated with blue brick which gives them a very toy shop appearance the wall is about twenty feet at the base diminishing by the inclination of the inner surface to about twelve feet the thin parapet is deeply embattled with immediate loopholes but there are no regular embrasures for artillery the chinese till lately have seldom used cannon but have usually stuck to the bow and arrow at each gate there is a semicircular enclosure forming a double wall over the two gateways are towers of several stories in which the soldiers who guard them are lodged also at about sixty yards apart along the whole length of the wall are flanking towers projecting about thirty feet from the curtain some of the cities have ditches before the walls the interiors of most chinese cities are very similar the houses are very low and the streets which are narrow are paved with flagstones suited however only for the passage of people on foot or for sedan chairs the road is often crossed by ornamental gateways with square openings in the centre one on each side not an arch these have been erected to the memory of distinguished individuals another feature in the streets are the slabs of stone covered with inscriptions about eight feet high and placed on the back of a tortoise carved out of this same slab the plan of the houses is very similar in all respects to that of those discovered in pompeii with open courts and rooms opening up to them they have more lattice work and paint and the ornaments and designs are of course very different the shops are generally open to the street those of one description being placed together 
as is very much the custom in russia portugal and other european countries suspended high above like a banner over each shop is a huge varnished and gilded signboard with a description of the style of merchandise to be sold within as these boards hang at right angles from the walls they contribute much to the gay appearance of the street the chinese delight in placing quaint inscriptions over their shops many of the streets are dirty in the extreme while the shops are dark and dismal and the shopkeepers far from urbane and accommodating people these narrow streets with their signboards and gateways with an ever-moving crowd of yellow-faced turned-up nosed pig-eyed beings in blue and brown and yellow cotton dresses wide trousers loose jackets and thatch-shaped hats carrying long bamboos with boxes or baskets hanging at each end or hung over with the paper lanterns or bird cages and all sorts of other articles and here and there a sedan chair with some mandarin or lady of rank inside borne by two stout porters and we have a fair idea of the chinese city then of course there are public buildings of larger dimensions and temples and towers of porcelain pictures of which everybody has seen then outside the walls are canals and lakes and curious high arched bridges and summer houses and pagodas in the suburbs of canton where the foreign factories are situated the shops are open and the streets are not so much ornamented as in the city itself but the plan of the houses and the general arrangement are similar no other ship of war was at canton when the dugon arrived captain grant had fully expected to find the blenny there and was much disappointed at her non-appearance he waited anxiously for several days but she did not appear at length he determined to sail in search of her to lose our consort and those two fine young fellows rogers and murray is very trying he observed to lieutenant cherry as they walked the deck together while the ship was standing away from canton as to the blenny sir she'll turn up before long depend upon it unless she is hard and fast somewhere on a rock answered the lieutenant hemming has been routing out some of those piratical scoundrels and they probably have given him a longer chase than he expected still captain grant was not satisfied as the frigate cruised along she brought to all the vessels of every sort she fell in with and made inquiries at every island and place where anything like a truthful answer could possibly be procured they had an interpreter a chinese who spoke english though rather of a funny sort and as it required a good deal of cleverness to comprehend it it may be supposed what he professed to wish to communicate was not always very clear the man who might most have assisted them ho de dodi had been missing ever since rogers and adair's battle on the island and it was supposed that he must have concealed himself for the purpose of returning home the dugong had been three days at sea when a clipper schooner with a dark hull square yards and a most rakish look hoved in sight early in the morning and approached the frigate on the coast of africa i should say that the fellow was not honest observed mr cherry who had the morning watch to adair i wonder what he wants a very pirate or slaver replies adair but she is only i suspect an honest opium smuggler honest do you call her exclaimed the lieutenant if because a vile system is carried on openly it is to be considered honest then slaving is honest and piracy and highway robbery for that matter see however her gallant skipper is not afraid of us look 
with what a self-satisfied air he walks the deck with his gold-laced cap and glass under his arm they are preparing to lower a boat and he'll come to pay his respect as one captain does to another in a short time the master of the schooner made his appearance on the deck of the frigate captain grant got up to receive him he was an intelligent dashing-looking young man i am glad that i have fallen in with you sir he began last night just before sunset i heard some firing and standing in the direction from which I, the sound came i observed a brig of war apparently almost surrounded by junks not far from the land to the southward of this out there i made sail hoping to render her assistance but so large a force of sailing and row junks sallied up from behind a point of land and made towards me that as i have lost half my crew with sickness and a former battle with a squadron of the villains i was compelled to up stick and run for it i shall be glad however to return with you and assist in piloting you to the spot thank you captain thank you answered captain grant extending his hand he wisely never denied nominal rank to masters of vessels however employed i most gladly accept your offer hudson is my name my craft is the flying fish and when you see her in a good breeze you'll acknowledge that she does fly along answered the master looking with pride at his trim and beautiful craft she and the frigate instantly made sail to the southward in a few hours the sound of an occasional shot saluted their ears and gave them hopes that the blenny was still afloat and able to defend herself as they got nearer they could make her out from the masthead amid a wide circle of junks which were keeping up a distant fire at her it is at this critical juncture felt perfectly calm captain hudson who had come on board the frigate and go gone aloft now returned on deck i know the trick of those fellows sir they hope to make her exhaust her ammunition and then to board her they seem pretty well to have done that already you must go to her relief in the boats or the villains may have cut the throats of all on board before you can get up to them this seemed too probable all the frigate's boats were now lowered armed with guns in the bows manned and sent away under the command of mr cherry without a moment's delay poor jack exclaimed adair to young harry bevan it was only the other day that he and i were pulling along just as we are now doing and now who can say where he is still do you know harry i have an idea that he'll turn up somehow or other he's always has done so and i can't help hoping that he and murray may yet be found i hope and pray so i'm sure i do said harry almost crying but i'm afraid there's very little chance of it even if the chinese picked them up they would be sure to murder them End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of the three midshipmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada the three midshipmen by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty eight the midshipmen in prison who would have ventured to believe that the fate of the brave true-hearted jack rogers and the gallant high-minded alec murray was to be cruelly murdered by a set of ill-conditioned barbarous chinese pirates yet such has been unhappily the lot of many of the finest fellows in the british navy and army when jack supporting murray with one arm 
looked up and saw half a dozen hideous chinese faces with flat noses grinning mouths and queer twisted eyes lighted up by the flames of the burning fire-ships gazing maliciously down on him he gave up all for lost had murray not been still insensible he would have swum away defying the sharks till he could have got hold of something to support him or he would have attempted to climb into the boat and had a desperate battle for his life as it was without sacrificing murray he could do neither a savage was standing up lifting a large battle-axe the bright steel of which glittered in the glare of the burning ships and was on the point of letting it fall with a crushing blow on his head and already jack felt the horrible sensation of having his skull crushed in and cleft asunder when another man sprang forward and seized the wretch's uplifted arm he could only turn the blow aside for the axe came down and the blade dug deeply into the side of the boat jack seized it for it formed a convenient handle on which to rest and afforded him the support he much required he fully expected to have another hack made at him and was considering how best he might avoid it when the pirates seized him and murray and dragged them into the boat still he did not feel much more secure than he had been in the water as he expected that as they might treat a useless fish they would throw him overboard again when they had gutted their revenge by knocking the life out of him if poor murray does not revive he will be spared much of the unpleasantness he thought to himself it is extraordinary how coolly he took matters he was rather surprised himself at his own indifference to his approaching fate the chinese were all chattering and vociferating together over him and murray as their bodies lay among the thwarts for he was so exhausted that he could scarcely move when he heard a voice say don't fear english officer i take care you no hurt very much obliged to you whoever you are answered jack but i say friend i wish that you could get me put into a more comfortable position and lend a helping hand to my poor companion here who will be suffocated i fear if something is not done to him all right by and by answered the voice let these men have their palaver out they no talk of kill you now that information is satisfactory at all events thought jack well i must have patience that never hurt any one and has saved many a life only i do wish these fellows would bring their palaver to an end and let me find out who my friend is the pirates at last brought their conference to an end they probably came to the conclusion that as a live donkey is of more value than a dead one and as profit more than revenge was their object it would probably better answer their purpose to keep the young officer alive and endeavour to obtain a ransom for them than to kill them and in consequence be hunted down with even more pertinacity than before as to being influenced by any feelings of humanity such an idea never for a moment crossed their brains jack and murray were now carried to a platform in the after part of the boat when the former was allowed to sit up with his friend's head in his lap and to apply such means of restoring him to animation as he could devise he turned him round on one side so that the water might run out of his mouth and was rubbing away as briskly as he could when he heard the same person who had before addressed him say all right i told you i come and help you now on looking up who should he see but one of the crew of the frigate the malay who spoke english who went by the name of josh grummet and his friend ho de dodi who it now appeared had deserted with him on the island it was josh 
who had saved his life from the man with the battle-axe and hodidodi who had advised the pirates not to kill them at all but to keep them for the more satisfactory object of obtaining a ransom after a little time by their united exertions marie recovered and was able to sit up and understand what had occurred jack was now much happier as to the future well thank you heartily josh for what you have done for us said he and i can assure you that if you go back to the frigate you will not be flogged or even have your grog stop tank ye sar answered josh but suppose me no go back no have fear of floggy at all please yourself said jack remain a wandering malay or become a civilized british seaman with greenwich in prospect however you have done me a great service and i wish to recompense you to the best of my power really alick i think that there ought to be a fund for pensioning those who assist in preserving midshipmen's lives we do not run so many risks of losing them he observed to murray who fully agreed with him i say josh he exclaimed after a little silence do just hint to those polite gentlemen that we shall make the amount of our ransom depend on the condition in which we are returned to our friends and that if we are starved they will not give much for us i'm getting very peckish are you alex i thought it was just as well to make those remarks in time besides it is always wise for people in our circumstances to put on a good face on matters it shows the villains that we are not cast down or afraid of them jos told hodododi who interpreted their request in his own fashion and the reply was that they should have some food when they got on board the junk at that moment the sound of oars was heard and an english boat hoved in sight some of the pirates were for fighting but jos represented that the british sailors were such desperate fellows that they would not hesitate to attack a big junk and would take her and make mincemeat of every one on board and that such a boat as theirs would be treated with still more scant ceremony so much to the midshipmen's disappointment they wisely pulled away as hard as they could go till they go under the shelter of the fleet of junks the boat belonged it appeared to one of the smaller junks on board which jack and alick were at once carried the piratical squadron now instantly made sail and a favourable breeze having sprung up they steered for the northward their notable scheme for destroying the english frigate having failed the fleet separated some taking shelter among the neighbouring islands others standing out to sea in quest of the prey but the greater number returning to their accustomed haunts in the neighbourhood of canton localities most frequented by traders in the china seas the vessel on board which jack and alick found themselves formed one of the latter fleet their captors were jos explained to them great diplomatists they argued that if they gave them up at once a small sum would only be offered for them but if they kept them for some time and made their friends suppose they were lost they would be ready to pay any amount demanded for their ransom they were not treated with much ceremony or civility but jack's hint about their condition when reckoning for ransom had one good effect and somewhat for a similar reason that an ogre or a slave dealer would sufficiently feed his captives they were amply supplied with rice and other provisions sometimes the dishes had a very suspicious look they don't eat babies do they said jack dipping his chopstick into the tureen placed before them and producing a limb of some creature which certainly had a very odd appearance no i fancy not answered murray but we had better not ask questions they agreed that it was in all probability only a monkey which had been seen on board 
but was no longer visible and as the captain and his officers partook of the same dish they had no cause to complain they soon learned to relish lizards and snakes well stewed with curried powder and rice and they came to the conclusion that a dish of snails was not in any way to be despised as they could take no exercise except to walk up and down the curious little narrow cabin in which they were confined they both declared that they were growing so fat that perhaps the pirates would after all demand a higher ransom than captain grant would be able to, or willing to pay i am really afraid that we are caught in our own trap said jack i thought that the pig-tailed pig-eyed skipper of ours when he looked in on us just now smiled very complacently at our sleek skins we must get josh to tell him that if we grow too fat we shall be worth very little there is nothing like moderation in all things there is nothing like honesty in telling the truth said murray we should have starved if we had strictly stuck to it in this case answered jack no matter we should probably have been much sooner liberated answered alec depend on it whatever a person tells an untruth he sets a trap to catch his own feet you are always right alex said jack with honest warmth and suppose all this time they have been giving us stewed babies and young alligators to eat how doubly punished we should be the junk on board which the midshipmen were prisoners was a curious piece of marine architecture she was flat-bottomed flat-sided flat-bowed and flat-sterned she was of course narrower at the bow than at the stern where indeed she was very broad the rudder was wide and fixed in a hollow in the stern to which it was hung by ropes or hawsers so that it could with perfect ease be lifted out of its place and slung alongside there was no stem but a huge green griffin or dragon or monster of some sort projected over the bows on each side of which were two large eyes chinamen's eyes in shape as josh remarked about them ship no eyes how sea way the sides though flat extended gradually outward as they rose so that on deck there was considerable beam the deck was composed of loose planks easily removed at the poop and forecastle were a succession of little sloping decks gradually narrowing as they rose in height and enclosed to form cabins the bulwarks were high and surrounded with large round shields of wood and leather and brass knobs and curious devices painted on them the anchors were curious contrivances made of some hard wood very large and cumbrous the flukes only being tipped with iron outside at the bows was a wonderfully awkward-looking wench for getting up the anchor and as jack observed when he came to be made lord high admiral of the chinese fleet there were a good many things he saw that he should have to alter the sails were made of matting with laths placed across them when it was necessary to reef or lower the sails the seamen climbed up these laths and standing on the upper yards pressed them down no downhauls being necessary bow lines however were used to stretch them out had jack and murray not been prisoners with the possibility of pirates changing their minds and cutting their throats they would have been excessively amused at watching the proceedings of the crew and rather enjoyed their cruise on board the pirate on deck there was an erection like a diminutive caboose but which was a temple or josh house the sailors were constantly making offerings before it apparently as the caprice seized them by burning gilt paper or thin sticks or incense one day the junk was caught in a calm and as a sail appeared in sight in the distance which the chinamen thought might be an enemy they were very anxious for the breeze to make their escape 
the midshipmen saw that they were very busy about something and soon every man appeared with a model junk which he had constructed of gilt paper a boat was lowered and these frail barks were carefully placed on the surface of the deep the men endeavouring to blow them away so that they might be clear of the ship jack was much amused and asked josh the meaning of the ceremony josh answered for why you don't know there is one great lady queen they call her lives up in de sky and she like to see dese paper junks so when she sees them den she sends breeze down to blow junk along jack was highly amused at this account well i never thought much of a chinaman's wit he observed but i did not think he was such a goose as to fancy that a breeze would be sent merely because he put some twisted up bits of paper on the water josh who understood some of these remarks looked at him and remarked when i board english ship i hear sailors whistle 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 when there is calm i ask why they do dat they say whistle for a wind now i think chinaman just as wise as a english sailor anybody whistle cost nothing chinaman spend money buy gold paper make junk much trouble dat please chinaman's lady god more dan empty whistle can englishman's fetish or whatever he whistled too excellent exclaimed murray the malay has hit us very hard that whistling for a breeze is in most cases merely a foolish trick but it is too indicative of unsound principles to be witnessed without pain if we really considered the matter rightly we should feel that every time we whistle for a breeze we are offering a senseless insult to the great ruler of the universe it is a remnant i suppose of some superstition of our scandinavian ancestors who thought by whistling they were addressing some demon or spirit of the elements that is taking the matter seriously alec but i suppose you are right said jack nothing that leads to error or that encourages superstition or that leads a person to rely on any other power or influence than that of god's merciful providence can be treated too seriously my dear jack answered murray here have we worthless fellows had our lives providentially preserved and we ought to do our utmost in every way to employ them in his service and to do his will and to make known his truth depend on it that it is a very useless sort of religion or seriousness which a man adopts only when he is on the point of death or feels himself too ill to enjoy life well well alec i will do my best to log that down in my memory and stick to it answered jack who always felt the force of murray's remarks which had already had a very considerable influence on him for good more probably than murray himself was aware of however he went on in faith speaking faithfully to his friend assured that he was doing his duty jack and murray did their best to make out in what direction they were going and from the very rough calculation they were able to form they conjectured that they had arrived at a group of islands within some hundred and fifty miles of the latitude of canton they were not allowed to go on shore but were permitted occasionally to quit their little cabin in the stern and to walk about the deck but the crew had communication with the land and brought off all sorts of provisions by which they benefited once more the fleet consisting of about a dozen junks put to sea the next morning it was almost a calm and as daylight came on a brig was seen apparently a merchantman with her foremast gone and otherwise much disabled there could be little doubt that she had got into her present condition from having encountered one of those partial squalls which occasionally occur in those seas 
a long consultation was held among the captains of the pirate fleet in which the crew as well as the officers took considerable part there was an immense amount of talking and gesticulation and flourishing of creases and daggers and swords and various other weapons and at last the sweeps were got out and the junks began to move in a body towards the devoted brig jack asked josh the malay what the chinamen were about to do cut the throat of every motor son of dim take the cargo and burn the brig then no one get away to tell news was the answer kind and pleasant intentions but what do you think we shall do observed jack i don't like the look of affairs they will be cutting our throats to prevent our giving an account of their doings perhaps the malay is mistaken answered murray they may not intend to murder the people or if they do they will keep us shut up in the cabin while the operation is going forward or they will make us swear before they set us at liberty not to give information i have no fears about our safety nor have i in reality said jack but i wish that we could render some assistance to the poor people on board the brig we might warn them of the fate intended for them but even if we got josh and hodidodi to stand by us i am afraid we could not do much in the way of fighting i am afraid not indeed said murray we must be prepared for any emergency it is impossible to say what will occur i like the feeling said jack i wish that we were on board the brig though we would have a fight for it but we are drawing near had the pirates intended much mischief they would have sent us into our cabin i suspect the pirate junks had now completely hemmed in the, the helpless brig she was american for just then the stars and stripes of the united states flew out from her peak two men apparently the captain and his mate were seen to come on deck with revolvers in their hands they turned round and shouted in english and spanish and malay down the hatchway to the crew to come up on deck and defend themselves and the ship and passengers like men no one appeared cowards wretches brutes will you have your throats cut like sheep without an attempt to defend yourselves take that then cried the captain and in his rage he hoved his pistol at their heads and stood prepared for his fate the mate threw his overboard which was a wiser proceeding and then folding his arms stood ready to bear whatever might occur those are brave fellows cried jack we must try and save their lives at all events the pirate crews now burst forth into the most terrific and unearthly shouts and urging on their junks dashed up to the brig and simultaneously threw their grappling irons on board her at the same time those nearest to her hoved fireballs and stink-pots and stones and bits of iron and missiles of all sorts on board and then reiterating their shrieks sprang on to her deck the captain and his mate who had hitherto undauntedly stood at their post were borne down and the pirates throwing themselves on them seized their arms and bound them to the mainmast there seemed to be a hundred or more pirates from the different junks their persons garnished with pistols and daggers of all sorts stuck in leathern belts and their heads surmounted with red turbans which increased the natural hideousness of their countenances some of the savage crew joined hands and leaped and danced round and round the deck with the most violent contortions of the body shrieking all the time at the top of their voices while others flourishing their daggers and shrieking louder than ever rushed below at that instant a cry very different from that of the pirates ascended from the cabin jack and alex heard it it is the voice of a lady or a female at all events cried jack alex we must go and assist her 
Josh, my boy, come along. Tell Hododildi he is wanted. The Chinamen won't stop us. They are all too busy. I am with you, answered Murray, as he picked up two Chinese swords, several of which lay about, and followed by the Malay, leaped unopposed on the deck of the brig. End of chapter 28「twenty nine of the three midshipmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the three midshipmen by william henry giles kingston chapter twenty nine the night battle the chinese pirates were so busily employed in the agreeable occupation of plundering the american brig that they did not observe the two midshipmen leaping in among them jack and alec had on it must be remembered turbans and chinese jackets and trousers like the rest so in the confusion they easily passed unnoticed i really think we might drive the scoundrels out of the brig and retake her observed jack as he sprang on no no sir one thing at a time if oo please answered jos the malay who heard his remark jos was right as jack afterwards confessed for though they might have swept off the heads of a good many pirates engaged in collecting booty the rest would soon have come to their senses and cut off theirs again the female cry was heard jack and murray sprang into the main cabin it was full of chinese rifling the lockers and searching in bed places or wherever anything could be stowed away no females were there but there was a hatchway and a ladder leading to the deck below the cries proceeded from thence so they jumped down leaving jos and hoddy doddy who had joined them to guard the entrance there in dim uncertain light they distinguished two ladies apparently one old and stout the other young struggling in the hands of half a dozen or more pirates who were endeavouring to draw the rings from their fingers and their earrings from their ears one lady was somewhat stout and oldish the other was young and slight and jack thought very pretty whether ugly or pretty would not have mattered just then she and the old lady were in distress and that was enough to make the midshipmen eager to fight for them whoever they were they were very much terrified but not so much as to prevent them from endeavouring to repel the indignities offered them not a moment was to be lost there was no room to use their swords without running a great risk of wounding the ladies so jack knocked one fellow down with his fist and another with the butt end of his pistol murray did the same they then both planted such thorough honest english blows under the ribs of the other two miscreants that they sent them reeling backwards among the casks and packages which filled the afterhold and there they lay sprawling unable to get up again it won't do to stop here alec cried jack haul along the old lady i'll carry the young one and we'll stow them away in our berth till we see what's best to be done come along miss beg pardon haven't time to ask your leave it's all right though jack said this after he had lifted the young lady in his arms and was carrying her up the ladder as he remarked there was no time for ceremony everything depended on the rapidity with which they could accomplish their enterprise thank you thank you sir i trust you said the young lady in a foreign accent murray who always admired jack's plans when anything dashing was to be done followed as fast as he could helping the old lady along he would have had great difficulty in making progress had not jos the malay comprehended what was required so he seized her under one arm while alec lifted her under the other and thus without molestation they followed jack on board the junk jack rushed into their cabin and placed his fair burden on a chair when alec and jos bundled the old lady in after her with a very scant ceremony indeed 
there was no time for any and then they closed the door and walked a little way off and tried to look as unconcerned as if they had done nothing to merit the anger of the pirates i begged the young lady not to be alarmed and entreated her to try and keep the old one quiet promising to defend them with our lives observed jack of course we will do so and jos will stick by us won't you jos said murray yes sir answered the malay but if chinese come aboard they cut all our throats stay do jos know what he do there was a peculiar fierce vindictive look on the countenance of the malay as he spoke which boded mischief without uttering another word he sprang on board the brig and disappeared among the crowd who were hurrying to and fro below removing the cargo just then murray pointed out to jack the brave captain and mate of the brig sitting on deck lashed with their hands behind them to the mainmast when those wretches have glutted themselves with booty they will indulge their evil tempers by tormenting those poor fellows could we not manage to release them while no one is watching us and let them hide themselves on board their junk we may perhaps by and by be able to form some plan to escape together with all my heart answered jack no time like the present here goes saying this he and murray seized their swords which they had stuck into the bulwarks and a few springs brought them up to where the captain and mate were sitting in an instant the knives were at work and the ropes were cut leap on board the junk my men we'll cover your retreat the captain and mate did as they were directed and had just reached the junk when several of the pirates saw what had happened and sprang after them had not the midshipmen undertaken to defend them their heads would have been off that moment jack and alec had fortunately gained the side of the vessel and there stood at bay they had cut down three of their assailants but others were coming on when the melee rushed past them crying out leap leap on board cast off or we shall all blow up a backhanded blow which he gave with his short sword cut down the nearest of their assailants and enabled them to accomplish his advice he and they without questions asked instantly cast off the grapnels and shoved the junk away from the brig before the chinese saw what they were about scarcely were they free when a rush of flame burst out of the hold of the merchantman and up went her decks with a terrific explosion carrying masts and spars and sails and cargo and the many hundred human beings who like ants in a granary were swarming in every direction rifling her of the treasures she contained the numerous junks surrounding her did not escape some were blown up others had their sides blown in and several caught fire or were more or less injured for a moment there was perfect silence everyone stood aghast and then down came clattering on their heads limbs and trunks and heads of human beings and fragments of spars and burning bales and canvas and packages burst open like shells scattering their contents on every side next arose shrieks and groans and shouts a hubbub most terrific the cries of the wounded and the imprecations of those who had escaped and been balked of their prey dat is just what i tort it would be said jos quite coolly watching the effects of the catastrophe as he assisted to shove the junk out from among the crowd of burning vessels the pirate captain and crew most of whom had got on board thought that they were very much indebted to him and the white men for having been the means of saving their vessel as they also had been the most busily at work and had collected a good deal of booty they did not at all take to heart the accident which had happened to their pirate companions they shrugged their shoulders and blinked their little pig eyes and seemed to think that it was just as well as it was seeing that they themselves had come off better than anybody else a few more junks having blown up and others burnt to the water's edge or sunk those that had escaped sent their boats 
not so much for the chance of saving any fellow creatures who might be struggling for existence as to pick up any articles of value which might be still floating the fleet then made sail away from the spot lest the explosion might be the means of bringing down an enemy upon them to interfere with their proceedings the midshipmen were now placed in a somewhat difficult position with regard to the ladies in their cabin how to account for their being there was one puzzle and how to save them from annoyance or insult was another the pirates seemed inclined to treat the american captain and mate as well as they had done the midshipmen they had seen them very active in saving the junk but it was probably not gratitude so much as the hope of obtaining a ransom which made them civil jos having intimated that they were hungry in a short time a mess of food was brought for the whole party to the upper raised deck in the after part of the vessel while discussing this meal they also discussed the means likely to be the most serviceable to the ladies the american captain told them that his brig was the wide awake that his name was william willock that of his mate joe hudson that they were bound to sydney in australia where the two ladies who were french and mother and daughter were proceeding i know what cried jack as if a bright thought had struck him the pirates seemed to treat men civilly enough could we not manage to rig up the ladies in men's clothes there's a chest of chinamen's coats and trousers in our cabin and the old lady would make a very tolerable mandarin i should think it would very speedily be discovered what they are answered murray it will be better if we get joe's to talk over the old pirate skipper and having excited his cupidity in suggesting a good ransom produce our captives and charge him to treat them well what do you say captain willock a very good plan i guess was the answer there is nothing like making it the interest of the man to do what you want him just let the ladies show themselves i suppose chinamen have hearts like other people and will have some compassion on them when they see their distress but how are we to account for their being on board and in our cabin asked jack let your malay friend then settle that he'll know what will be the most likely to go down with the chinamen answered captain willock i think rather that we should boldly say that we brought them and claim them as our share of the loot as the indians call it the booty said murray now all the miserable wretches from whom we rescued them have in all probability been destroyed there will be no one unless any of our own crew saw our proceedings to witness against us when the pirates find that they are to get a ransom for the ladies they will be very much obliged to us for having saved them and depend on it we'll treat them properly murray's plan which was certainly the wisest as it was the most straightforward was agreed to they however said nothing till late in the evening when the fleet of junks dropped their ponderous wooden anchors close to the shore in a beautiful little bay surrounded by green hills covered to the water's edge with trees the pirates are fellows of some taste to choose this beautiful spot for their harbour observed jack looking round not they answered captain willock with a laugh i guess now they choose it because it hides them pretty securely and they could sweep out and pounce down on any unfortunate craft which they may catch unprepared for them in the neighbourhood but here's our skipper fi tan you call him don't you well he's a mild decent quiet old gentleman don't look as if his trade was cutting throats you'd better tell him about the ladies or he will be finding it out himself jack and alec agreed to this and calling joe's begged him to open the subject to the pirate captain which he did with no little circumlocution and very considerable departure from the real facts of the case notwithstanding jack's charge to him to adhere to them the malay had two reasons for this in the first place he had got so completely into the way of telling falsehoods that he could scarcely speak the truth had he tried and in the second place he knew that speak the truth or not he should not be believed 
old Phi tan having heard joe's to an end and watched the dumb show of the midshipmen and americans desired to have the cabin door opened the old lady who had thrown herself into a bed started up and was going to shriek out when captain willock's voice reassured her her daughter who had been watching while she slept stood trembling by her side but tried to look as composed as she could captain willock and the midshipmen soon made them understand what had occurred and begging them to be no longer alarmed promised that they would do their best either to effect their escape or to obtain their ransom oh but our friends are all in australia we have no one at canton to care for us cried the young lady wringing her hands never fear miss said jack i beg your pardon but i don't know your name but i don't doubt the merchants there will come down with all that is required and if not the midshipman on the station would be delighted to pay your ransom and take it out of the pirates afterwards when we catch them the young lady who did not exactly understand who midshipmen were or what taking it out of the pirates meant nevertheless thought jack a very polite young gentleman and thanking him warmly told him that her name was cecile dubois and that her mother was madame dubois but that she only spoke french and as she was now too old to learn english she hoped he would learn french to talk to her jack with a flourish of his turban which head covering he and murray wore instead of their caps which they had lost assured her that he should have unbounded pleasure in doing so if she would undertake to teach him but miss cecile added jack now that i know your name it is pleasant to call you by that before we begin wouldn't you like a little food you and your mamma must be peckish i suspect and she doesn't look as if she was accustomed to starve this want being made known to joe's he in a short time procured an inexplicable sort of mess not altogether unattractive to which at all events the old lady seemed perfectly ready to do justice though the younger one with a taste which jack admired only ate some of the rice and the less oleaginous morsels altogether the midshipmen were pretty well satisfied with the turn affairs had taken but poor captain willock had to mourn over the loss of his ship and cargo as also probably most of his crew some he had seen taken prisoners and dragged off on board the junks whether the throats had been cut or whether they were to be found among the pirate fleet he could not tell others he had too great reason to fear had been blown up they were cowards some of them to be sure or they would have stuck by us and we should have beaten off the pirates but still i cannot bear to think of them all being cruelly murdered observed the captain to his mate i guess you're not far wrong captain answered joe hudson if it hadn't been for these british officers we should have been where they are pleasant or unpleasant we only did for you what i'm sure you would have done for us answered murray we like to see the brave way you met the pirates and we're very glad to have assisted any americans whom we look upon as cousins the next thing to our own countrymen thank you sir thank you said captain willick warmly taking alec's hand if the britishers and yankees were always together we might flog all the world i guess who might try to oppose us thus harmony prevailed among the captives for the next two days the fleet lay at anchor those junks which had suffered by the explosion of the brig being engaged in repairing damages jack got on very rapidly with his french for having nothing else to do he studied very hard and mademoiselle cecile happened to have a copy of paul and virginia in her pocket when the vessel was attacked it served as a capital lesson book as murray already knew french he did not require miss cecile's lessons and so he was able to look philosophically on like a wise monitor he told jack to take care what he was about 
neither to take possession of the young lady's heart nor to lose his own whether he would have taken this advice which was sage and sound it is impossible to say but other stirring events happened which put a stop to the french lessons one evening the midshipmen observed the pirates in a great state of commotion those who were on shore came off and armed themselves after their fashion by sticking pistols and daggers in their belts and hanging swords over their necks and then all hands set busily to work to get their ships into fighting order joe's who had been on shore came off among the others and informed them that another pirate fleet had hove in sight and that it was expected that it would come into the bay to attack them for the sake of making them disgorge the booty they had collected pretty scoundrel said jack there is not even honor among these thieves themselves no sir answered joe's quietly big man in dis country always cut little man's throat if little man got any ting worth having pleasant remarked jack i would rather be an english ploughman than a chinese mandarin while the midshipmen were talking to joe's captain Phi tan came up and intimated to the latter that he should expect his prisoners to take an active part in the battle and to assist in defending the junk a cool request remarked jack however as fight we must probably to defend our own lives and those of the two ladies we may as well make a virtue of necessity you agree with me murray and so do you captain and mr hudson well then joe's tell captain Fitan that we will fight for him but that he must give us any recompense we may demand joe spoke to the pirate captain and immediately said that he would agree to their terms that's to say he'll take the fighting out of us first and then if he finds it convenient change his mind remarked captain willock i know the way of the chinese you cannot trust them perhaps when we have taught them to trust us they may learn to be trustworthy themselves observed murray besides these fellows are professed pirates what can you expect of them they are all alike all alike all rogues and vagabonds together answered the skipper after this somewhat sweeping condemnation of a whole people their conversation was interrupted by the pirates bringing them a heap of pistols daggers knives and swords with which to cover their persons in chinese fashion to be ready for battle darkness now came on and in a short time lights were seen in a pretty dense line reaching across the entrance of the harbor the dark outlines of a fleet of junks soon after this appeared through the gloom and forthwith gongs and cymbals began to clash and shrieks and shouts ascended and guns and jingles and pistols went off while fireballs and rockets and stink-pots and other chinese devices for warfare filled the air and truly made night hideous end of chapter twenty nine recording by john brandon chapter thirty of the three midshipmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada the three midshipmen by william henry giles kingston chapter thirty an attempt at escape rogers and murray and their companions watched with considerable anxiety the approach of the fresh horde of pirates from the number of lights they showed and the noise they made it was very evident that their fleet was much more powerful than the one which had captured the brig if we were on shore now i should little care if the result of the fight was like that of the two kilkenny cats adair tells a story about who fought so desperately that at the end of the battle only their tails were to be found said jack they having in a way none but the irish cats could have succeeded in doing eaten each other up 
paddy sticks to his story and declares it is a truth but does not exactly explain how it happened rogers remarks were cut short by one of the two shots striking their junk on which the crew set up the most terrific shouting and began blazing away from all their guns jingles and other firearms jack and alex and captain willocks and his mate loaded their muskets and began to fire away and to make as much noise as the chinese but they none of them at first took much pains to aim at the other pirates their object being to make their companions suppose that they were fighting desperately however before long a jingal ball grazed jack's shoulders and that put up his blood i say it won't do we must drive these villains off he exclaimed if we don't we shall be getting the ladies throats cut and our own too i am afraid so answered alec it isn't pleasant fighting either way so they now loaded faster than ever and took the best aim they could all the firing and shouting did not stop the advance of the enemy and jingal balls and other missiles came flying thicker and thicker round their heads those poor ladies what will become of them they must be very much frightened cried jack a considerable number of the crew were by this time hit many were killed outright and as far as the midshipmen could judge their side was getting the worst of it still the shrieks and cries in no way diminished but rather grew louder and more unearthly one large junk appeared to have singled them out and was steadily approaching to board their crew evidently did not like this state of things the old captain had just come up to them with josh the malay as interpreter to make some proposal or other to them when as the words were coming out of his mouth a round shot took his head off and his body was sent flying half across the deck what he was saying josh could not tell and gravely remarked that no one was now likely to discover the crew on discovering their chief was killed and that they had lost so many of their companions showed signs of unwillingness to fight at last one ran to the side and overboard he jumped and began to swim towards the shore one after the other followed like a flock of sheep all taking the water exactly in the same way till not a pirate remained on board the midshipmen entreated josh to remain and hodidodi engaged to stick by them the ladies probably can't swim observed jack but if we could manage to launch a boat we might get away before the big junk can scull alongside there was a boat but on examining her they found that she had several holes in her side which was the reason the pirates had not taken her that's pleasant cried jack now if those fellows board us in a hurry before josh has time to explain who we are we shall get knocked on the head to a certainty we must stow ourselves away i fear till the first rush is over said alec we must keep outside the ladies cabin so as to protect them i'm afraid so said jack and he ran and told madame dubois and her daughter what had occurred and entreated them not to be alarmed advice which was more easily given than taken jack then ran back to murray who was trying to induce josh and hodidodi to remain with them they were very naturally wishing to swim on shore under the belief that they should be knocked on the head if they remained on came the huge junk and in another instance would have been alongside when as the midshipmen began to feel that too probably their last moments had arrived a loud roar was heard up went her deck and masts and sails and fierce flames burst out from every part of her the same event which had happened to the brig had occurred to her she had blown up the bodies of the poor wretches belonging to her and the burning fragments of the vessel fell close alongside them and nearly set their junk on fire 
had they possessed a boat they would have done their best to render assistance to the drowning wretches as it was they ran to the side of the vessel and got such ropes as they could lay hands on to heave to the people who were swimming about the pirates however believing that if they came near the vessel they were about to attack they would simply be thrust back again into the water or be knocked on the head or have their throats cut or be disposed of in some similarly unpleasant way kept at a distance and the midshipmen saw them one by one disappear beneath the surface all this time the battle was raging on every side round them and the attacking fleet drew closer and closer to the junks at anchor and appeared to be gaining the victory as soon as they could the midshipmen ran to the ladies cabin to tell them that what had occurred and to give them the such consolation as they had to offer but could not we manage to make the vessel sail and run away exclaimed cecile with considerable animation as if a bright thought had struck her i wish we could miss dubois said jack but there is no wind and we have not strength to hoist these heavy mat sails of the junk ah but i will help you and so will mamma i'm sure answered the young lady mamma would be of great assistance in hoisting i doubt not said jack looking with an expression of humour which he could not repress towards the weighty dom we'll try what can be done they could not venture to remain long in the cabin so they hurried back on deck they were as much puzzled as ever to know what next to do their great fear was that the pirates would return from the shore and prevent any attempt they might make to escape when they told the american captain what miss cecile had proposed he said that she was a brave young lady for thinking of such a thing that perhaps a breeze might come off the land and that if it did they would try and sway up the foresail scarcely had they come to this resolution when by the flashes of the guns they saw a boat pulling a short distance ahead of them the american captain hailed a voice answered immediately in english why that's one of my men as i'm a free-born american exclaimed the captain come here be smart now in less than a minute one of the boats of the brig came alongside with three seamen in her they had been captured by a junk and finding the boat floating astern they had taken the opportunity during the confusion of the battle of jumping into her and pulling off the boat was too large for the three men to manage and they would probably have been lost had they got outside not a moment was wasted in bringing the two ladies from the cabin and in lowering them into her captain willox and his mate and josh and hododildi followed and they were hurriedly shoving off eager to get away from the junk when murray asked the rest if they were going to live on air and reminded them that they would all be starved if they had not a supply of provisions very right sir observed josh me go find food accordingly he and the two midshipmen and mr hudson jumped on board again and hunted about for food it was rather difficult to find in the dark but they got some jars of water and a bag of rice and a collection of nameless things which they supposed were to be eaten they got also a small stove with fuel and a saucepan altogether considering that they seized whatever they could lay hands on they had reason to be satisfied with the result of their search fortunately just at that particular spot was in comparative darkness though on either side of the pirates were firing away at each other as furiously as ever captain willox took the helm and the two midshipmen with joe hudson and the malay each seizing an oar away they pulled at a pretty good speed from the scene of action the shot however every now and then came whizzing over them and made madame dubois shriek out rather too lustily her daughter on the contrary kept perfectly silent 
or if she spoke it was to entreat the old lady not to be alarmed but ma chere feel if those horrid balls should hit us how dreadful was the answer yes ma mere but crying out will not stop them remarked miss cecile an observation which jack highly admired he and alec and the rest pulled with all their might as they had good reason for doing with the prospect of liberty before them and imprisonment or death if they were recaptured as they drew out from the light thrown on them by the flashes of the guns and away from the shot they all breathed more freely and madame dubois began to leave off screaming giving way only at intervals to a short hysterical cry as the sound of a more than usual crashing broadside reached her ears at last they were completely shrouded by the gloom of night and they could only now and then hear a faint rattle in the distance captain willock steered northwest the direction in which he supposed canton to lie on they pulled for several hours till at last they grew very tired and hungry so they stopped rowing and cried out for food joe hudson had charge of the provisions from the first bag he opened he produced some tough dry lumps on the nature of which no one could pronounce till they had reached the malay he bit away at one and then remarked want boiling crawl crawl berry good do slugs cried jack hand something else out the next bag was full of some long dry things which might have been eels but were very probably snakes frogs and snails in a dried or pickled state were not more tempting but at last they came on a basket of shellfish which with some unboiled rice stopped the gnawings of hunger but did not make a very satisfying meal they were afraid then of lighting a fire but they agreed that they would do so in the morning once more they took to their oars they now however could not make much progress nor could they have done so had a breeze sprung up as they possessed no sails they hoped therefore that it would continue calm in this however they were destined to be disappointed not long past midnight a gentle zephyr began to play over the surface of the water and soon it turned into a light breeze and that increased into a stiff one and by degrees it grew stronger and stronger and the sea got up and tossed the boat about and that made madame dubois scream as loud as before and now and then the spray washed over them and then she screamed louder still and next it was discovered that the boat leaked and it was necessary to employ two men constantly in bailing to keep her afloat the more she tumbled about the more she leaked and the louder poor madame dubois screamed her daughter proved herself a regular heroine and made no noise and only grasped the side of the boat tighter as it rose and fell on the seas the morning approached but matters did not improve the wind blew stronger the waves grew higher and seriously threatened to swamp the boat i say alex this is no fun observed jack what's to be done we must get under the lee of the land till the gale moderates answered murray the wind it must be observed was favourable but the sea had now got up so much that it was dangerous to run before it captain willox agreed to murray's proposal and watching their opportunity they got the boat round head to the seas and pulled in for the shore this was very trying after all their labours but they were not the only people in the world who have to toil in vain or have to undo all the work they have done and begin again they now shipped less water but they made very little way in consequence of the heavy sea daylight at last came but did not exhibit a pleasant prospect the green seas tumbled and foamed about them the dark clouds hurried along overhead while about three miles off appeared the land with the harbour that they had left a few miles along the shore on the port bow 
the idea that they might get into some bay or inlet and remain there till the weather moderated was a considerable consolation still pull as hard as they could they could not make their heavy boat go ahead but rather found themselves drifting farther off the shore the great thing however was to keep the boat afloat hour after hour thus passed away till at last the wind began to fall and the seas quickly went down and instead of making for the shore it was proposed putting the boat about and continuing their course the captain was looking out for a lull to do this when an exclamation from his lips made everybody turn their eyes in the direction towards which he pointed the port they had left where several large junks were seen rounding the headland which formed its side on the west they all anxiously watched the junks they were steering to the northwest they are in pursuit of us observed jack little doubt about it i guess said captain willox can we not escape them said murray by lying quietly down at the bottom of the boat we might said the captain we'll wait though till they come near the junks advanced and from their appearance it seemed too probable that they were the very fleet of pirates which had entered the harbour the previous evening and that having been victorious they were again sailing in search of fresh plunder we had a narrow escape then observed jack if we had remained we should long before this have been food for the sharks in the bay i guess that we shall be lucky if we are not down the throats of some of them before night pleasantly observed captain willocks madame dubois did not understand him or it would have set her off screaming again she willingly enough laid down in the bottom of the boat and jack in his choicest french begged she would keep quiet her daughter followed her example and as the sea had gone down the oars were laid in and the rest of the party placed themselves under the thwarts out of sight as however the junks were steering almost directly for them they had little expectation of escaping notice jack had great difficulty he confessed in refraining from jumping up every instant to watch the progress of the junks what do you say alec he explained suddenly suppose we arm ourselves with the boat stretchers and the moment a junk runs up to us jump on board and capture her it's the best thing i can think of to do we should probably be knocked on the head and be sent overboard again answered alec we must stay quiet and wait the course of events i suppose it's the wisest thing but i should like to have a fight for life said jack with a sigh the boat kept slowly turning round and round and just then by lifting his head up a little he saw the mastheads and sails of two junks which were bearing close down upon them there seemed now an impossibility of their escaping detection we are in for it whispered jack let's have a fight i guess it would be a short one answered captain willox stay quiet mr rogers if you don't want all of our throats cut two minutes more elapsed and the high sides of two large junks crowned by big round shields and numberless hideous grinning faces looking down on them appeared one on either hand a couple of grapnels were hubbed into the boat which was nearly crushed between the two vessels and a dozen or more pirates armed to the teeth looking more like demons than men sprang into her before jack or murray or captain willox or indeed any of the party could offer any resistance they had passed running nooses over their shoulders by which those on deck hauled them up without power of resistance jack and alex the american skipper and josh were fished up on board one junk and they saw to their great regret the french woman and her daughter hoisted up on the other poor madam half dead with terror shrieking out vain petitions to be set on her feet 
josh josh cried jack when he saw this tell the pirates they must let the poor ladies remain with us they will frighten them to death josh shook his head no good now he answered mournfully they cut all our throats just then the junk which had caught the midshipmen separated from the boat and they with the captain and josh being dragged by the pirates into a cabin were unable to discover what became of the rest of the party End of chapter thirty